Devil May Cry is a weird one out there franchise-wise, wouldn't you agree? Over the top and grounded at the same time. When you play one of the games in this series, you just have to respect the developer's skill at juggling all of it. And where else to look at a variety of tone than in the main characters? Two of them I already have made videos on. Dante, the pizza-addicted demon hunter. Starting off goofing around in a personal journey that matures him in many ways. Turning him from being uncaring and revenge-seeking into the fun-loving hero we have today. Nero, the emotional young adult whose brutality against they who would harm those he cares for, almost pushed him down into the darkness, only to be pulled back into the light by his loved ones. Showing us a man who is desperately clinging on to that light, whether it be through the proprietor of the agency or his girlfriend slash stepsister Kyrie. And finally, the one I haven't looked into yet, who before the fifth game seemed pretty one-dimensional. Only the Void can judge the Void. What? Only to see different sides of him, to understand how one day can change things drastically for different people. And that is of course... Virgil, the oldest son of Sparta, twin brother of Dante and father of the hero of DMC4. He truly is the string that has connected every game in this series, either directly or indirect. So let's look into this blue-coated human-demon hybrid as he journeys through hell itself in hope of becoming a true devil. Now, I doubt that I need to say this again, considering my intro. But for those of you unaware, the character V in the fifth game is his humanity personified. I say this because we will mention him a few times before going into the later parts of our boy's journey. We all understand one another? Perfect! Let's start at the beginning! Looking all the way back to when he was just a child, we now know, with the help of the DMC game and manga, a bit more than last time we had a peek into the household of Sparta, at least when it comes to the two brothers. Pushing aside the Battle of the Chocolate, we can see that the protagonist is shown to be energetic, playing around with fake swords, and seem to be the one instigating every childish dispute he has with his older twin. On the other hand, the firstborn shows a bit more introversion, like listening to classical music, proven by V's little taunt. And his love for reading, specifically poetry. The best way to show just how much he loved the art of expressing feelings through literature is that he constantly visited an old bibliophile in the city. Who this old man was, we do not know, nor does it matter that much, but what I find fascinating is that this person may have meant a lot to the son of Eva, as one of Virgil's most cherished possessions was a gift from this unknown fellow, an anthology book of William Blake's greatest hits. Plus, looking at the old man's diary, the adult described the young boy as being a pure youth whose love for literature overshadowed even his own when he saw how the silver-haired child wrote his name on the back of the book because he was worried that his twin brother would take it from him, making the man's heart melt. Oh, Rosie, I love this boy. The parents decided that for their eighth birthday, they would give the children the part of the perfect amulet, and of course, the two blades known as the Rebellion and the Amacho. What is worth noting here is that the katana was given to the oldest son for one potential reason, and that is the fact that Sparta might have considered his firstborn to be his heir. The reason for why I believe this is that the eastern weapon was the one used to separate the human world from the demons, so owning that key would have been a great responsibility, and considering that it was given to the calmer of the two, it's not that hard to believe. The future truly seemed bright for the boys, both freely playing on the green fields. Though what the future did bring was anything but the seeds of love. As when their father had vanished without a single trace, the demon king saw his opportunity for revenge against the husband of Eva, sending minions to attack the household. Their mother was quick in hiding Dante away, but as she ran off looking for the timid emotional of the two, she sadly did not make it. So uh, where was Virgil during this attack? It is difficult to understand how he ended up there, but he was cornered at a cemetery by many of the monsters. He did have his weapon with him, but he was but a child at this time, making it really easy for the beasts to bring him down to his knees. And as he rested against the tombstone, he saw a lone tree in the distance, the one outside of their house, and behind it, his home burning down. Something within him changed, and at the same time, one of the demons had taken the sword from the boy and stabbed him with the Amato. And that was the final key, to pull his inner devil's power, killing everything around him in a single moment. Terrified and alone, he ran away, believing not only that his mom had left him behind with his younger brother, but also having the lingering thoughts that it was his powerlessness that caused all of this to happen. This would start setting him off to a path that would turn the youthful pure boy 
into something no parent would be proud of. <gasps> NOT PROUD! <gasps> OH MY GOD! What happened between the death of his mother to the next time we see him, I have no clue. There simply is nothing out there that gives us that info, but considering just how insanely strong he is, we can come to the conclusion that he's been practicing his swordplay, while also doing some real in-depth research on his father, as that is his primary motivation throughout his entire journey, to gain the power of Sparta. This leads him to a city called Fortuna, the home of the cult, the Order of the Sword. The reason for coming here is that the Order is a religious group, praying to the Dark Knight, a demon, as if he was a god. Looking for more information on him, it makes obvious sense that he would end up there sooner or later. What does not make that much sense though is that instead of filling his mind with secret knowledge, he filled up a lady. What? It does stand out, doesn't it, considering just how much of a one-track mind he has, but the simplest answer would most likely be, and I feel like Dante worded it the best, <laughs> I guess you were young once too. This unnamed lady would most likely have been a lady of the night. A seducer. A prostitute! I mean, main reason for believing this is that she gave her child to someone else to raise, and considering how she is dressed, the maiden most likely wasn't homeless, so yeah. Virgil learned how powerful money was to gain love, and later he would learn the consequences of it. I'm the one with power. How repulsive. But I'm moving ahead of myself, so let's talk a bit about what happened one year prior to the first game in the chronology. The Dark Slayer, being the studious boy that he is, ends up meeting the man named Arkham in the library. At first, the demon threatens the bald man, claiming that if he keeps bothering him, death will be swift. Yet the dark art dabbling individual shows that he may hold knowledge on how to gain access to hell, and so they team up in an uneasy alliance, shown by how our hero <laughs> doesn't even want to be close to him. I said the same thing in my Dante video, but it is important to remember that the manga was never finished, hence I won't take too much from it. We do know that some of it is canon. The releasing of the seven deadly sins demons, the wife sacrificing man mentions it in DMC3, and of course, the first encounter between the two brothers. So at least the only thing worthy of our notice. Like how easily the older teen pushed the aggressive one away, exclaiming that the amulet that he needs to destroy the demonic seal could be retrieved whenever he felt like it. Though, as he didn't need it at that very moment, he allowed the wielder of the rebellion to keep it for the time being, walking off to continue on with the ritual. And that leads us directly to our first video game, Devil May Cry 3. The game that introduced us to the single-minded individual. Or should I say, double-minded. Relax and let me do all the work. I'm motivated. Surprisingly, even if that's the case, there isn't that much to go through here. Mostly Virgil's relationship towards both his brother and Arkham, the latter of the two being sent at the beginning to check out if the series protagonist still has his part of the amulet, as again, it is needed to open the portal to hell. As all of the other seals has been shattered, the Tower of Temenigru rose up, pretty much inviting the Demon Hunter over as a challenge, as he is, at that point, a very selfish person. I recommend my Dante video. <laughs> Only thing we need to focus on are when the twins are fighting and how the older brother acts in the small snippets that we see him in. For example, just like we saw in the manga, Virgil shows no interest in his colleagues preaching, nor does he feel like they are equal at all, which happens when the silver-haired demon decides on killing the man. We also can note that he doesn't even give a word to any of the demons residing in the tower, killing the reaper with efficiency and Beowulf stylishly, proving that there are some playfulness hiding beneath the cold exterior. But what we want to look at is, of course, when the brothers are together. The family matters. Patiently waiting for the reunion on top of the structure, we do see that Virgil is willing to have a conversation with his younger sibling. They don't really try to convince one another on anything, as both of them clearly are wanting for a good fight, and considering that the blue-coated speedster still holds the record since their previous encounter, the bastard sword-wielding warrior clearly is looking to even the score. <gasps> It was a pretty clear victory from the Katana user. Hell, he didn't even pull his Devil Trigger. What he does pull, however, is a question. Why do you refuse to gain power? The power of our father, Sparta. This perfectly summarizes Virgil's blind attitude of what he once lost and what he is trying to achieve. There was a time when he loved Sparta as his father, but now he views that feeling as a weakness. He is only following his father's shadow to not feel the loss he once did, when he isn't even capable to remember or see what matters to him at that exact moment in time, as he clearly is looking at the past in disgust when he was incapable of protecting his mother, the trauma making him only walk forwards, unaware that he might find his happiness in what is right in front of him. But this will be more focused on later, as now he has everything he needs to complete the ritual. He thinks at least, making him cut all the loose ends around him, one being our boy Arkham, 
He really likes doing that, doesn't he? We might need a Virgil Stabometer. Die. Vega Blast. Come. Reason for this betrayal is that the power seeking boy believes that Arkham is keeping Lady alive because of some love for his daughter, saying that this is a clear human weakness. The older man's rebuttal is really interesting though, as he turns the words against the son of Sparta himself. What about you? You're an incomplete being as well. Oh. Both demon and human blood mingle in your veins. Shut These words would definitely haunt the young teen for many years. Finally getting to the inner sanctum, he immediately begins the ritual, connecting the amulet pieces, shedding his own blood, and... Getting really pissed off when he realizes that something is missing, as the guy who had the most knowledge of this ritual stuff might have excluded a thing or two. Damn you, Dowd! Wait, what? <laughs> Frustration getting bigger, having no clue on what to do next, while also having the lingering doubts on what the bald man told him. Another thing jumps into his way. Dante, who is far more powerful than last they met. Though instead of building onto his wrath, Virgil starts feeling enthusiastic for a rematch, as proving his superiority for his little brother has always made him feel a sense of happiness. How they talk about their parents is once again what we want to focus on, primarily that the older of the two might be the one at this point that still considers them all to be a family, as weird as that sounds. He might only talk about power, but a neat little touch that always stood out to me, when the oldest son is talking about their parents, he acknowledges the fact that Sparta is both of their father. But the other boy... So, my mother's amulet is the key that unlocks the door to the demon world. I just find that really interesting. But the second fight didn't get the same overwhelming victory for our guy like last time, having both twins go all out, devil trigger, different weapons, Virgil even asserting dominance by punching the ground like Superman! But before there could be a winner, their fight was prematurely ended, but they're still alive Arkham and his daughter. Putting their differences aside for a moment, the sons of Sparta and the daughter of Arkham stand together against the spawn of Mr. Clean. But since the man had activated the tower with the blood of the bazooka gal, this doesn't end well for our heroes. <laughs> You, you're finally awake. Seeing that the portal of hell has been opened, Virgil immediately sets off to the path towards the entrance, not caring for anything else. Not even Lady, who attacked him earlier. But maybe that's because she's not the Lady of the Night. I think. What I absolutely do know though is that the next time we see him is when he decides on helping his little brother against the Jester, who has fused with the power of their father, exclaiming that it's not worth being in his possession. And together they stood against the devil, which is normally the only time when we see them stand together on anything, when it comes to a third party who wants something from their family. Making quick work on him, as the Sons of the Dark Knight together are seriously too OP, they end up once again standing against one another. This time there was no enthusiasm. This time there was no arrogance. Right then and there there, we see two souls with completely different goals. One looking at the future, wanting more power than anything else, and the other looking at the present, seeing his own flesh and blood, willing to burn all others for his own gain. But this fight ends in a way that the firstborn couldn't even have imagined. Am I being defeated? The reason for this loss is that during the entire Temini Gru catastrophe, only the younger of the two truly grew. He learned the value of humanity, feeling empathy and compassion for others, which he once locked away, and is finally willing to see his older brother as just that, family, trying to stop this fight from happening. But the older son? He only felt more anger and frustration as things didn't go his way. Ava wanted for her children to grow up together, getting strong in the harsh world, standing side by side under the light of the sky. But where Dante could finally see the situation that they were in, Virgil could only look at what was in front of him, what he had to pursue, making the young demon hunter do everything in his power to stop the demon in front of him. Realizing that it is his defeat, he grabs hold of his mother's keepsake and proudly states that it belongs to a son of Sparta, deciding that he wants to stay in hell, as that dimension is their father's home, giving his little brother one last gift before vanishing for many, many 
years. Beaten, exhausted and weak, the wielder of the Yamato looks up towards the darkened sky, seeing something that would change his life forever. The Prince of Darkness himself, Mundus, the murderer of his mother. It is probably fine to assume that he knows the part the Demon King played in the death of Eva, as he is aware that the Three-Eyed Devil was once defeated by his father, so with the last ounce of his strength he charged forward towards his future, once again not looking at the present. Ending with his utter failure, Perfectly symbolized by the shattered Yamato, the sword given to the heir of Sparta. Wanting to truly spit on the legacy of his mortal enemy, the ruler of the underworld corrupts Virgil, filling him with pure demonic power while containing his human side, turning him into an ugly depiction of the Dark Knight as a minion of the Demon King, Nello Angelo. So the first DMC isn't that important to his character. Most of the stuff he goes through in this game is more explored in the last one. He fights for control when he sees his brother's amulet, showing his weakness for his mother is still beneath the horrible curse that is holding him. The familiars that V controls in the fifth installment are materialized from his nightmares from that time. The manga pretty much focuses on this. And that the humanity side of him shows a great deal of hatred towards anything that resembles the fallen angel. Nice. Getting the band back together, huh? What evil lurks. I must destroy. I thought that was the plan all along. What I'm also quite sure of is that he would have felt a great deal of anger if he saw that after everything he went through to gain the power of their father, it was Dante that got a hold of the Devil Sword Sparta, and after that, the power of the Dark Knight. Let's just skip to the latest game in the franchise. We don't have enough information on what happened between Devil May Cry and the Adventures of Nero, only that the part of him transferred over to his son's arm, as the emotional boy said that he heard someone coveting power when his appendage transformed. And there is nothing out there explaining how he still had a physical body before reclaiming his sword and power, so yeah. Devil May Cry 5, everyone! DMC is back! back. No! Slowly dying from everything he has gone through, our humble demon now walks the path to reclaim what is rightfully his, in order to right the one mistake he made all those years ago, to defeat his brother. In his eyes, it was that fateful fight that caused his fall. And even if he has to turn into the most terrifying being ever, he will beat Dante. So in order to do this, he visits Nero, which at this point is not aware of their blood relation, and asks if he can give him a hand. Boy. <laughs> With his father's heirloom in hand, he makes his way over to where everything began, and I'm not talking about his journey for power, but where his life started. His childhood home. Throughout his life, he has researched everything he could on this legendary figure, and he found out many different things, one being a special ability that his sword has. Not only can it split open dimension, but it can also split man from demon. Believing his humanity to be a great weakness, he turns the katana towards his heart, yet he himself turns away from everything that his fathers fought for, and the love that his mother gave him. And so begins his journey, in not following Sparta's footsteps, but the Demon King, Mundus. <laughs> Human and Devil now separated, we have both one of the protagonists of the game, and also the primary antagonist. V, the poem-reading, classical music-loving man, and the Devil, who would become everyone's reason to fight. Eventually named Eurism. But it wasn't just these two beings that came into the world when the dimension-cutting blade impaled the dying son of Eva. The three familiars that Mr. Kane can summon in battle also came into existence. But wasn't the sword only supposed to separate the two parts of Virgil? Well, according to the manga, Visions of E, which follows the man's story before the game begins, they tell us something interesting. In a desperate attempt in casting away his nightmares, the trauma he suffered as Nello Angelo, he split his memories into the three demonic figures, all of them based on the other beings serving the cruel murderer. So when we know that he even threw those haunts from his mind, it proves just how horrible that time was. <laughs> <laughs> 
Time, however, isn't really something that the human has. The devil already made his way to activate what is called the Clyphot tree, in hope of filling its roots with so much blood of man that it will nourish an apple. And when that fully ripe fruit has been eaten, the greatest power in the demon world will be earned, something that even Mundus once did. So when the future emperor is biding his time, the weaker of the two starts looking for something that he doesn't have anymore. Power. And we can see this thirst for strength so easily, feeling the same hopelessness as when he lost his mother, and a sense of doubt when talking to Trish, the demon who was made to look like Ava. Though, just because V is the human side of Virgil, that does not mean that he's a goody two-shoes, as his resentment for his younger brother is still there, blaming him for everything that has happened. But he also realizes that without the legendary demon hunter, his other side would win. So he goes to get his help, even if it's a tad bit too late. Because the Clyphot has started to rise up from the demon world into the human's realm, killing so many people, turning them into husks. But we are talking about Dante here, the dude that defeated Mundus. He can easily... <laughs> On the devil's side, he punches his little bro into a month-long coma, destroying rebellion in the process, RIP best sword. He traps both Trish and Lady in demonic beings, and throughout the majority of the game he is chilling in his chair, still waiting for the future to come. On the other side of the coin, the human is helping Nero, trying to find the devil's horse Bada, and slowly dying. Wait... Yes, the twins are more demon than human, considering their father and all. V's body can't handle the lack of the demonic juices, giving him a time limit in completing his goal in returning to his body, hoping to stop the horrors that he, or other Virgil, has committed. So time is moving on, and eventually Eurison is getting a visitor, who is none other than Nero. Though no matter how hard the young man fought against the demon king, he was just dead weight. And as the devil is about to finish off the young demon hunter, unaware of who he truly is, someone else decides on crashing the party. Interfere. Pizza time. This turned out to be Dante, of course, who has activated his true demonic heritage by absorbing both the fragments of the Rebellion and the Sparta. This fight proved to be far too much for the Monarch of Evil, as he had been slowly pushing his own power into the tree. But as the time had finally come, he ended the bout prematurely by going to the deepest part of the underworld, to where the fruit was ripe. And so our heroes ran after him, Nero rushing in by fighting all of the enemies that he could find, V helping as much as he was capable of, still slowly dying, almost getting killed by a powerhouse only to be saved by the previously mentioned man, finally telling the son of Virgil the truth about who the devil really is, the twin brother of his friend. And what about this third figure? What did he do when realizing that this could truly be the end of the road? The curtain fall for the sons of Ava and Sparta. But all fun and games must come to an end, as the red-coated demon hunter has finally gotten to Eurison's location, the deepest chamber where the apple had created an illusion, the family home of the two boys. Why it does this is difficult to say, but it's not that hard to assume that the fruit is making the illusion in trying to seduce those standing in front of it by showing the person their greatest regret, pretty much saying that with this power, you can force the world to change. Dante tried to appeal to his older brother, trying to tell him that their mother didn't leave Virgil behind, but tried her best before getting killed. But his words fell on deaf ears. It was far too late for this. Maybe things could have been different if he had opened up all those years ago, but they have never been emotionally open. So he reached up to the apple, seeing the power he has sought for so long, knowing that the leaf of the tree will bless him with a freedom reign. I will have everything! Illusion shattered, the devil gleefully prepares to use his divine strength in purging his little brother from the world. The Dark Knight Sparta's legacy being that of two sons, one who followed in his footsteps, saving humanity from devils, and the older boy, who blinded by suffering, followed the previous Demon King's shadow. And so their epic battle ensued. Only to surprisingly go into the hunter's favor quite quickly, making the devil question how he could be that powerful without having lost everything like he did. Showing us that even if he separated his humanity from his demonic self, he is still motivated by pain. Only for his opponent to answer him. It's not about loss. Strength is a choice. 
fighting like hell to protect what's important. You threw away everything you ever had. No wonder you have no true power. Dante! Having defeated yet another Demon King, the hero is ready to finish off the devil. But as the dying human was a bit faster in his devil trigger finger, something different happened. The oldest son of Sparta is back. Virgil. V and Yuri and gone, and best boy back. Virgil states that he will not fight the weakened Dante, telling him that they will settle their matter later. Being grateful to Nero for his help throughout everything, the katana wielder teleports to the top of the Clyphot tree, doing something rather surprising reflecting on his current situation. He has always looked towards the future rather than looking at the present, but after everything his human side went through, something has changed within the man. But this is still about his brother, someone even Mr. Poetry blamed. So even now it was too late for them to talk it out. Again, these guys are good at fighting, not so much talking. So while our boy is still sitting in his chair, like seriously, did Mundus force him to stand straight every day or something? Dante is on his way to confront his older bro for one final time. After dropping a bombshell on his nephew, of course. He's your father! Say what? But he actually meets the familiars before getting to the top because they decided they shouldn't merge back into the original body as that would mean that all the memories, suffering and trauma from the Nello days would return as well. Attacking the legend, they knew that they didn't stand a chance. Doing all of this for Virgil's sake. This is our final flight. And the end of Virgil's nightmares. Finally, here it is. The battle that they both have sought for so long. Dante fighting to protect those dear to him, trying to save the world from this demonic parasitic tree. And Virgil, who has now not only gotten the power he has always wanted, but also returned to his true form. The only thing they both knew is that only one of them would come out of this alive. How many times have we fought? Hard to say. It's the only memory I have of us since we were kids. Time to finish this, Virgil. Once and for all. Seemingly equal in power, they keep on fighting like they have always done. But with their tunnel vision, things might end even worse than before. Dante is looking at the man who threw away everything for selfish gain, killing thousands of innocent people, while Virgil is looking at the individual in his life that always stood against his happiness, whether it be to a small degree or a larger one. Their war has gone on far enough, and they both are willing to put an end to it all. This meant a lot to me. She tried to save you too. Why? Nero jumps into the fray to stop his father and uncle from killing each other. His emotions finally triggering his own devil trigger. What better way to stop two stubborn brothers from murdering each other than having a guy who wants to protect family above all else? And it definitely is a wake-up punch for Virgil, who now can no longer force the future to change for his own goals when his own legacy is standing in front of him, trying to force him to look at the current situation. A bit of a wake-up punch for Dante as well. I'm good, aren't I? Being intrigued, and for good reason, he is willing to let it all slide. He has followed his own father's shadow for so long that now seeing someone following him reminded him that he is not alone. So he is willing to humor Nero. 
But he's not going to make it easy, as he wants to see what his kin can do against a proud son of Sparta. Fuck you! You've disappointed me, Nero. Accepting yet of your existence or your strength. Both you fucking asshole! Interesting. After having such a strenuous dance with Dante, Virgil couldn't keep up with his brutal child. Willing to accept defeat for now, he, with post-motivation clarity, understands that the Clyphot tree will do more against him at that point. So he goes with his brother to cut it down from the demon world. But as Nero is heavily against losing his family again, his father gives him what he has cherished for such a long time in his life. The William Blake Anthology, pretty much saying that he will return. And so here they stand. The two sons of Sparta and Ava, two seeds born from love, finally side by side. Before this, they only stood together against a superior being, but now, even after cutting down the tree, they fight. But not to destroy the link between them, but making it grow stronger. This is never gonna end. Maybe. We got plenty of time. <laughs> Virgil was someone who cherished his time with his loving family, living in the moment as a child, enjoying classical music and having passion for poetry, going even so far to visit someone else who loves it as well, while only really having an issue with his extroverted younger brother. But as the shadow of Mundus fell over his home, his powerlessness changed him into something his parents stood against. Solely searching for power to never feel weakness again, blinded by his trauma, he forgot that he was not alone. He viewed his humanity as a flaw, eventually to the degree where he threw it away. Yet it wasn't before discarding it until he learned that he himself was the reason for his solitude. Doubt being the primary ingredient for him trying to force the world to change. But in the end, it was his own legacy, the son he didn't know that he had, that forced him to change. And as the both brothers are sitting there, sharing a true smile after so many years, he is willing to acknowledge that what was once a weakness in his eyes, with how things are now, without a shadow of a doubt, maybe it's okay having it be a part of him. And that is the mind of Virgil. There's only one thing remaining unanswered. Who won their final fight? <sighs> Score for Dante. I'm up one. <laughs> Where did you learn to count? <sighs> We're even. We're even. Hi there, thank you so much for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, leave a like and comment. Tell me what you both liked and disliked. It will help me improve and it feels nice to read comments. What do you think about the length? Too long maybe? And if you have stayed all the way to this end screen, I recommend following the two artists who made some awesome stuff for this video on social media. Link in the description. I also stream a lot, so go to my Twitch page and click a follow there as well. Anyways, I'm King Grimm, or the guy who's tired of DMC. Whatever you prefer and I'll see you guys next time.